Today, we're gonna to be introducing the Social and Engineering Systems Doctoral Program. This edition of the webinar is for September 2021 admissions. You're gonna be hearing from IDSS Director, Professor Munzer Dale, and from me, IDSS's Academic Administrator, Beth Milnes. We'll start off with an introduction to the Institute for Data Systems and Society, go on to a more in-depth coverage of the Social and Engineering Systems Doctoral Program, and then conclude with some frequently asked questions and answers about admissions. So to start us off is Professor Dale, who is introducing the MIT Institute for Data Systems and Society. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Munzer Dale, and I'm the director for the Institute of Data Systems and Society. So this morning, I would like to speak to you a little bit about the Institute itself and uh, how it relates to the PhD program, uh, the social and engineering systems PhD program that we have, that we offer in this system. The mission of uh, the Institute is to <clears throat> address um, major societal challenges by utilizing um, uh, data science, information decision sciences, and social science. The confluence of these areas are critical in solving a lot of problems in many different domains. And what I would try to do today is to give you a bit of an idea of the scope of the types of problems we are tackling, but more so kind of what unites them all together, what brings them all together as one sort of uh, concentration for which the SES PhD program has been designed for. So our vision is to be able to combine uh, different facets of the same problem. When you think about uh, many applications today, today, whether it's actually engineering application or scientific applications or applications that come from social sciences, uh, you notice that uh, the, there are many components that interact with each other. Part of it is design and part of it is social behavior and part of it is economics. And, and it's often the case that researchers tend to abstract one piece um, in order to focus on another piece in order to be able to give some realistic uh, or at least kind of abstract answers to the questions that they're interested in. Um, so we would like to be able to kind of have the PhD program have a large consequence in these complex societal problems, um, you know, we want to do things with rigor, um, and rigor can be done in a lot of different levels. But the, the point is that, you know, kind of rigor in terms of verifiability, in terms of being able to generalize and so forth, but also would like it to be uh, targeted to specific domains. And that's one of the reasons why we have involvement by all five schools at MIT. Um, in, in supervising students in the PhD program, because the domains can just come from anywhere um, uh, on campus and in the world. Uh, however, we as an institute, um, our uh, positions within the new uh, Schwarzman College Computing, so computation and data is certainly a, a signature that is really critical for this particular PhD program. Um, so it's multidisciplinary, <clears throat> it tackles a lot of different domains, uh, going from energy, environment, uh, finance, healthcare, um, but more, you know, um, and uh, social science questions, uh, questions about misinformation, questions about radical behavior, <clears throat> expansion of radicalism and so forth. And um, we don't like to limit the types of questions people would like to ask, but generally people would like to do things like prediction of a certain phenomenon or resilience, uh, cascaded failure. And I'll give you some examples that will highlight how these things interact. Okay. So one example, which is interesting, of course, is the financial system. And uh, uh, if you think about the 2008 uh, crisis, it's fairly interesting to recognize that the subprime mortgages that um, created um, the, the problem are less than five to 7% of the total volume of the market. So here's a situation where the a crisis occurred because uh, there were problems in a small, relatively small um, fraction of the market. And one, one wonders sort of how can something like this happen? How can a small percentage of the market 
result in a cascade that actually um, um, uh, one of the largest collapses of financial markets that we've seen in the past. And that is a phenomenon about interconnectivity. Today, the markets are not separated from each other. There are derivatives, derivatives that are defined on top of uh, stocks and they're combined and mixed and sold. Um, in addition, I think people have uh, um, a direct impact because people are in themselves creditors investing in this particular market and playing sort of um, the prediction game. This interconnectivity has made that market very much more complex and a lot more uh, difficult to, to, to understand and to guarantee its resilience than say, for example, the situation that was in many, many years back when markets were separated and markets can actually be sort of um, tackled separately in terms of um, uh, investment and growth and what have you. Another example, of course, that we're living in today is the pandemic. And if you think about the pandemic, this is a very beautiful example of where the SES program uh, brings in the different components of how to tackle this particular problem. Um, the Spanish flu um, uh, that happened many, many years ago has similar symptoms to what we have today in the COVID-19. And it's not clear away from driving a vaccine that we have a much better solution than what we've done uh, during the Spanish flu. So has stuff really changed since then? And I think that one of the things that we want to be thinking about is how does one have a, a sort of a systematic way of tackling a pandemic that comes in when, for example, you cannot develop the vaccine in a short amount of time. Of course, you need to have a system in which a vaccine is being developed very rapidly, but away from a vaccine, what do you do? This is a good example where one aspect of it has to do with human behavior. Another aspect has to do with the virus itself and its properties and what works and what doesn't work. And of course, a third component of this is testing and, and quarantining and, and being able to track people that are sick. It's, an, it's a com complicated system requires uh, institutions to make decisions, requires people to make decisions, and it requires scientists to provide scientists to provide a better understanding of this particular virus. Another area that has become really important is the data itself. There's no question that machine learning methods and AI and so forth have actually seen a tremendous development in the last decade or so. And right now, I think you know, there's more and more demand of data. Yet at the same time, in a lot of the situations we're interested in, the data that you would like to have is not data that is available to you. Um, um, a lot of time you have to pay quite a bit of money that you want to, um, uh, if you want to say, for example, in the case of systemic risk for the financial market, can you actually get the data that you care about? Your data is important, not only just marketing, not only just purchases. Of course, I mean, there is a, a whole ad market, uh, digital ad market that is predicated on people's data that is of the order of a hundred billion dollar market. Um, and yet the data, individual people's data are being used in this particular market, but the people themselves are not being part of that market. So how do we assess the value of the data? And how do you quantify your privacy in terms of how much your data is actually relevant to other people. And for example, is there a way that data can be commoditized in such a way that we can act, or not commoditized, but maybe sold because of its value? So we have a, a project in idea sense, for example, that looks at digital farming and looks at poor farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa and try to see if their data can act as a, an investment for them in order to bring their uh, economic situation to a level where they uh, can actually prosper. How does data, how is the data used in that particular way? And how is their data being traded in such a way that others can benefit from the same thing? So that's another kind of a question. Finally, I'll conclude by talking a little bit about advertisement and, 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 and uh, information and, and social media. You know, native advertisement that represents itself in terms of uh, marketing, you know, sort of like a, a recommendation networks that put in ads and, and stories within regular networks um, that looks and feels like the rest of the stories, but in fact are not similar to the same stories. You see that every time you open your CNN app and you see the bottom of a lot of these uh, um, uh, kind of um, marketing or advertisement um, uh, stories. How do, you how do you separate 
actual news from this sort of type of advertisement news that is actually out there for a profit um, and not to inform people. And what is the effect of having these types of news on the overall confidence that we have in, a mar in, in, the, in the social media? Um, how do we understand fake news and how does fake news propagate in networks? And why does it propagate seemingly a lot faster than regular news? So that's a question about platforms. It's a question about um, social behavior and, and, and so forth. And I think that this is also an important question about understanding what data is needed to understand this, this particular phenomenon. So I would just want to conclude by saying that in all the examples that I described, and this one particular one I, I shared for the COVID-19, it really comes in at the interaction of three different components. One component that has to do with engineering, science, or, or physical systems that we build. One piece is that piece has to do with how people interact with that, with that component. And the third piece has to do with institutions and regulations and policies. And it's really the interaction of these three components. You see it in the COVID-19, you see it in the financial market, you see it in the misinformation. The interaction between these three components that decides how the system is going to operate. And the only piece that allows us to analyze these things are data. They are connected on these three components. It can be connected on the physical system and how people behave through social networks and data about institutions. But it's not a trivial exercise to take the data and try to understand how these systems work. And a lot of what we do in SES is try to understand, can there exist uh, abstracted models for which we can link the important pieces of these, these three components to make recommendations, either policy recommendations or an analysis of prediction of some sort or suggestions of how to design a system to become more resilient and what have you. And that's actually the core of our PhD program. And the program is highly connected into this vision of um, IDSS. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Manzer. So now we're gonna pick up and take a look at the Social en Engineering Systems Doctoral Program. What sets SES apart from other programs? Well, as you might expect from an MIT program, SES starts with technically accomplished students. And uh, as you might also expect from a program in MIT's new Schwarzman College of Computing, SES coursework is grounded in information, systems, and decision sciences. So while it's hard to overstate the utility and importance of these methods and approaches, SES students have a few additional distinctions. First, they're motivated by a desire to solve big societal problems. Next, they pay attention to the context and conditions currently on the ground. They do this through dimming focus classes or through an internship. Also, and very significantly, SES students utilize social science methods because people, organizations, cultures, communities, and governance structures are integral to their work. What all this amounts to, um, and this preparation allows SES students to do, is to take on a wide variety of research. So we think our students end up with a unique perspective and approach to analyzing and addressing problems. Our students also end up being the kind of researchers who seek out and enable highly interdisciplinary collaborations. So that's what we're trying to prepare our students to do. The next few slides are gonna give you some basic information about the program and the preparation we provide. So we start off with students taking three out of the four following uh, foundational or core classes. They take probability, statistics, microeconomics, and empirical research methods for the social sciences. We think these align pretty well with the goals we just went over. And another benefit that this really brings to mind is that by taking all of these classes together, Students admitted to the SES program at the same time form a cohort through PSETs, exam prep, and all that other sort of shared coursework. SES students end up helping each other learn these fundamentals. So even at the very beginning of the program, having students come from a variety of disciplines like economics, like computer science, engineering, math, computational social sciences, we find is a real strength of the program. As you may already suspect, and will certainly see later in the presentation, SES can prepare students to tackle some truly diverse topics. 
So beyond the core, students need depth within their particular area of focus. And students develop this depth within three dimensions. First, they take five classes in the information systems and decision sciences. They take another four classes in the social sciences and they take two application classes focused within a particular problem domain. One of those classes can be an internship. So if you do the math, that's five plus four plus two, which is 11 required classes for the program. And this is a lot, but we think because SES is interdisciplinary, more classes are important and necessary. A few notes, so it's not quite as bad as all of that. The core classes we just talked about do count towards the 11 required classes. So for instance, probability and stats both count towards the required five classes in information systems and decision sciences. And microeconomics or social science research methods can also count towards the social science column with four classes. Finally, I can also quickly mention that if you've already taken relevant doctoral level classes, maybe possible to waive a few required classes in your SES doctoral program. We can't really sort this out in advance of admission. It can only be determined after students have settled on their research focus and found a supervisor. But what I can say is that it's not uncommon for a student entering with a previous master's degree in a relevant field to be able to waive a class or two. Another aspect of the program, as with all doctoral programs, is the qualifying exams. SES students normally wrap up the written exams at the end of their third semester. The oral exam typically happens during the student's third year and after they've had the chance to develop an SES research project. An important thing to mention here is that most students pass the quals. If a student is admitted to SES, we believe that they're going to be able to qualify. Another important aspect of the program is that the mentorship provided around the development of research skills is really emphasized. So SES students have several advisors over the course of their program. They have an academic advisor that they're matched with shortly after admission. And this is a person that is from a sufficiently unrelated discipline that they're probably not gonna end up being student supervisor. And that lets them focus on being an impartial resource for the student. They're there to help guide class selection. They're there to help the student search for a research group and a research supervisor and they're there to provide impartial advice. Students also have a research supervisor. So this is an MIT faculty member, uh, typically, who serves as the primary advisor for students' research. And often this is the, also the person who ends up funding the student as an RA after their first year in the program, but this doesn't necessarily have to be the case. We also encourage another supervisor from a complementary area. So if, for instance, a student already found a supervisor in computer science who has funding for their work about the spread of misinformation in the social networks, um, maybe that student's also looking for additional advising from a political scientist or an economist. And then finally, students form a doctoral committee. And this has an additional one to three experts uh, in addition to their supervisors. Uh, these could be faculty, researchers, and they can be from different schools or PhDs who are doing work in the public or private sector. A typical question we get asked is, how long does this all take? And we don't really know yet. With our first class started in 2016, and not all of those students have graduated yet, but our informed guess is going to be about five years. So here's what a typical SES doctoral program might look like. Uh, in a student's first year, they explore research options. They identify a research supervisor and they plan their coursework. In their second year, they complete the written exam and they advance their research in preparation for the oral exam. In their third year, they're ready to discuss the early stages of their research, the available data, their understanding of previous work, their preliminary formulations of research questions, analysis, conclusions, and their thoughts about additional work. At this point, 
they take their oral exam and form the committee of experts who can best guide the remainder of their work. At the beginning of their fourth year, and after months of working with their committee, they've hopefully refined their plan into a formal thesis proposal. And from then on, they're really focusing on research. So by the beginning of their fifth year, they've been writing, publishing, and preparing for the next stage of their career. And around at the end of the fifth year, they're hopefully defending their dissertation and graduating. A common question people have, and, and frankly a concern, is how they're gonna fund five years of graduate education. And the answer is SES is typically fully funded. So here, here's a look at fall 2019, which was a pretty typical semester. You can see here that about 60% of the students are working as research assistants, usually on projects closely aligned with their research. We have another 10% working as te teaching assistants which we think is great for building up teaching credentials for students pursuing faculty jobs, or for students who just want a little more flexibility than an RA is able to offer them. And then we have an additional 30% on fellowship. Most of these fellowships are IDSS or MIT fellowships, and they're awarded internally. So if you look again here at this breakout, you'll notice that most of those fellowships are awarded to first years. And the reason for that and why we like that model is that this enables first year students to really explore the research opportunities available to them when they start their program before committing to a particular project, selecting a supervisor to work with. So the next question is, what do SES students actually research? Well, uh, here's a snapshot from spring 2019. You're gonna see that Social networks and revenue management slash marketing uh, are the biggest areas, but topics in finance, economics, uh, energy, and the environment are also well represented. And there's another chunk of students there who are working on topics, some, some really diverse fields, um, but we've just sort of here loosely grouped under other public services. In the COVID era, in the post COVID era, I think we can expect more research and funding for healthcare topics. IDSS did a lot of important work in the last year motivated by the COVID-19 crisis. Another area that we're seeing at MIT uh, and that MIT is actively advancing is more work focused on climate change. So that's an area I think where we might end up seeing more research focused in the future. What all this I hope is pointing towards is that it's always fair to say that this graph is gonna keep changing over time. The societal problems that we're really focusing on and addressing continue to shift. Another question is, what is the SES PhD gonna prepare students to do? So we can't share the statistics on alumni placements quite yet. The sample size is two, but what we'd like to see is our alumni pursuing important and transformative work across a number of fields and sectors. And because we have a lot of collective experience working with doctoral students at MIT, we, we think it's reasonable to expect this. So we're hoping that the students who are interested in faculty careers could join a variety of departments. We think that rigorous preparation in statistics and data science has been and can, will continue to be highly desirable across a variety of fields. And we think that the desire for candidates prepared for interdisciplinary research like this is also out there and well represented. We think that students are gonna be drawn to the public sector to pursue research or to inform and influence policy. And we think that students are gonna be drawn to the private sector where they have the chance to impact the direction of, of large existing industries, or perhaps advance their own innovative ideas. Next up, milestones. With Professor Dale, who's now gonna tell us a little bit more about milestones. So a couple of things I wanna talk about um, before we end this webinar. And one aspect of this is um, talk a little bit about the milestones of ideas yes, and SES. So in 2016, we admitted the first cohort. So now we are in, you know, in, in the fifth year now into our program. 
Uh, in 2017, we were lucky to have the contribution of, uh, of the Hammer family to endow this program uh, with fellowships. Um, this is um, in, in recognition of the legacy of Michael Hammer, who used to be a professor at MIT, who was a very successful entrepreneur. Um, in 2018, we actually uh, launched the interdisciplinary program in statistics which is a, a different than the SES program in that it works within the body of students in MIT and students in SES, of course, can also get an annotation of statistics as part of their PhD thesis, but that program also is beyond the SES program. 2019, MIT launched the, the M. Schwarzman College of Computing and IDSS became an integral part of, of, uh, of this particular college, of this college. Um, and uh, in 2020, we had our first graduate uh, from, uh, from the SES program. So we, I think we've gone a long way um, in this particular program. Um, and just very quickly to say about the interdisciplinary program and the PhD program, the interdisciplinary uh, program in statistics, um, it kind of, you know, it's a unique program in that it works with uh, different departments. It aligns the uh, requirements and, um, and the um, uh, qualification and so forth with the way the department does their requirement qualification. So the program looks differently from the eye of different programs, but everybody in this program gets a core education in probability and statistic computation and data analysis. Those are the core, core concept of uh, the program in statistics. Um, uh, but our students in the PhD program can also be members, can be students in the interdisciplinary program in statistics and, uh, and so forth. And you can construct and structure your classes in such a way that the requirements for statistics are met by the requirements of the SES program. Another program that we have is the technology policy and policy program. This is a, a more than 40 year old program in policy as, as, as it relates to technology. Um, it's a master's program, so it's a two year program. Uh, but students from this program have applied to the SES program. Of course, the, the technology policy program is a larger program. It admits over 30, 30 like about 35 students a year. Um, and the SES program is a much smaller in scale, but the top students of the TPP program have often applied and admitted to the SES program. There is no guaranteed path, but it is a path. Um, that uh, people follow. But TPP in its own right, a very interesting master's program where you get educated in the sort of the main kind of uh, ideas of how to come up with quantitative and qualitative ways of assessing and understanding policy, particularly in the context of, of um, uh, technology. Um, there will be upcoming webinars, more details of that, and, uh, and you'll be hearing more about that particular program. Thanks again, Professor Dalle. We're now going to move on to the frequently asked questions about admissions. So one of the first questions we get asked is, what does an ideal SES candidate look like? Um, and here's our standard answer. We're looking for someone who demonstrates academic excellence in a variety of relevant areas. And that can be engineering or applied math or one of the social science disciplines. We're looking for someone who's motivated to solve the same sort of problems that interest us. So that's usually concrete and complex societal problems with technological aspects. We're looking for someone who has sought out research experience. There's a variety of ways to do this and you can do it in industry, in undergrad or through a master's program. And all of these are great. We're looking for someone who has a track record with the types of systems that fall within the scope of the program. And again, there are a variety of ways to do this through coursework, through internships, through research. What we don't expect or require is full-time work experience or a master's degree. But if you have either of these things, that's great too. It can help clarify your motivation for doing the program. And it can also demonstrate experience and expertise in relevant areas. Another question we get asked pretty frequently is how competitive the program is. And the answer is pretty competitive. We're seeing north of 200 applications every cycle, and we're admitting somewhere between 20 to 10 applicants and hoping to get a class of about 10 for the new year. 
Another question is, what constitutes a complete application? So here's what we're looking for. We're looking for a statement of objectives that talks about your preparation, your background, your motivation, and the kinds of research that interests you in the doctoral program. We're looking for all of your post-secondary transcripts. We're looking for three letters of recommendation from people who are in a position to talk about your preparation. Typically, we'd like to see at least two of these letters from faculty or researchers at an academic institution. Normally, we're looking for GRE scores, but for September 2021, we're not accepting them. And the reason for this is that the pandemic has disrupted people's ability to access the exam. So we wanna have everybody submit their applications on a level playing field. We're looking for a proof of English proficiency. And finally, we're looking for a CV or a resume talking about the parts of your background that you think are relevant to admission. So here's a little more detail on what we're looking for with English proficiency. Four consecutive years of secondary or post-secondary education in English. So for Americans out there, that's high school or college, or a 7.5 in the IELTS exam academic format. Unfortunately, we don't accept the TOEFL. Here is a summary of some of the relevant dates and deadlines for the application cycle. The online application opened September 15th and completed applications are due at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the 15th of December. And we'll get back to you by the end of February with a substantial update on your application. In the meantime, if you've listened to this webinar, if you've gone through our website and you still have more questions, write to us. We're at IDSS underscore academic underscore office at mit.edu. And we can point you to more information sources attempt to answer your questions. And if a short meeting would be helpful, we can schedule a short meeting with admission staff to discuss the program. Finally, I'm excited to let you know about a new initiative being trialed for the September 2021 admission cycle. Graduate student volunteers are going to offer an application advice referral service intended as a resource for prospective SES students from historically underrepresented groups in higher education. Prospective students who wish to participate would be connected to volunteers who can answer questions about SES and provide advice about the program grounded in their own experience. So participation is entirely voluntary. It's not gonna be disclosed to the SES admissions committee and therefore it's not gonna impact admissions decisions. If you're interested in learning more about the program, check out our website and we'll have information there for you shortly or depending on when you're listening to this, it'll already be available. So thank you. Thank you for your interest in the SES doctoral program. Thank you for listening for the entire webinar. And we look forward to seeing your application. Bye.